This programme features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Hello everybody and Jumbo everyone and welcome to the safari all the way in Kenya and we are in the Mara Triangle and as always my name is David and on camera today is Archie. Hi Archie. Well, we've been out here for the last 15, 20 minutes uh, looking at lions that you just saw one earlier there. And this is what we call the sausage trip ride. And it has been raining and the rains just stopped. And when the rains were on, I had to use this wrap on which is green in color just to keep me warm. Remember, this is a very interactive safari. Your questions are very welcome. If you have any comments as usual, hashtag Safari Live. Don't be shy. Keep us busy. Beautiful temperatures, as much as it's called 28 degrees Celsius and about 82 degrees Fahrenheit. It's your show. Join us until we end the show. Welcome again. And we got a pride of lions here that we call the Sausage Tree Pride of Lions. And the one that you see in front of us, we have given it a particular name and we call it the Kink Tail Lioness. She's laying down there and way in front, way in front, sorry about that. That's the kink tail there, sorry, that's the kink tail. And if you see her flicking her tail, you'll see that that tail is a bit kinky. And she is with a sister that we just saw earlier. There are always four females and you have some males that hang around. And the main male that will be around this territory uh, is called Kipuli. But what you see there, that's the kink tail lioness. Hello there. So with all the showers going on, the temperatures have cooled off. It feels very good for me. And not any wildebeest close by, but we're just hoping at one point, should they feel hungry, this is huge space. And the migration is still on in the Mara Triangle and possibly something might happen later. But remember, I am not alone here, uh, not here in Kenya, I'm the only one, but down south in South Africa, in Juma, there's another gentleman that would like to say hello to all of you. And look at that, I've got one of the lovely animals and this animal, I've been observing him for a while now. He is just moving from one green tree to the next. A very, very good afternoon and welcome to the beginning of the afternoon safari. I am Sydney Fumuran Mikosi and I'm here with Dave this afternoon. Hopefully you are going to enjoy the wildlife experience here by Juma. My plan for this afternoon is to look for the spotted cats and for your questions and comments you can follow us on twitter hashtag safari live you can also follow us on youtube chat stream look at that the giraffe is now slowly disappearing so these giraffes they are now getting very clever they are only targeting the green trees but they are not eating until they finish i'm very sure the trees they are also starting to realize that uh, they are the only ones starting to become green first they must have to regulate this browsing activity so i'm just going to pull forward now and see if we can have a better sighting So the rain has stopped a little bit this afternoon, but the weather is still promising that we might have some rain before we finish with this game drive today. So this giraffe is walking very fast. He has just been here now. So now let's go to one of my colleagues, James. He's just about to take off now. Let's hear what James is up to this afternoon. You say I'm about to take off. That's quite exciting. I don't think I'm about to take off, but it would be very nice to take off and fly over this region like a battalier eagle. I'd like to take off like a battalier. That would be fantastic. Good afternoon. Welcome to this end of the sunset, although there won't be a sunset today. Safari here in South Africa in the Western Kruger National Park. My name is James Hendry and it's marvellous to have you with us here again. We have got Sebastian Drombi on camera. There he is. That is his thumb. 
which will be used to operate the camera as the amazing things we see you today. We're going to go down to where Sydney this morning had a dead nyala. Now that's a little bit macabre to go down and see a dead nyala, uh, but it might not be macabre if something has decided to come and eat the dead nyala. Also interesting to think what may have killed it. We're not really sure. There's been talk of some sort of disease. We have alerted the Sabi Sands. I'm not sure if they've come down to have a look or not. We'll go and have a look-see and make our own assessment. It won't be based on science because I'm in, uh, by no means an immunologist or virologist of any repute whatsoever. Please ask us any questions, of course, using the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. It would be lovely to hear from you or at FC on the YouTube live stream. My greatest wish is to reacquaint myself with the grumpy Queen Tandy and the mischievous Princess Claramba at some stage. That would be very nice. In the meantime, let us acquaint ourselves with the first cuckoo that I'm going to show you this summer season. And I believe it to be the Jacobin cuckoo. There it is. Hello. Now, the Jacobin occurs in two colour morphs, one with a white belly and one with a black belly. That one's got a white belly. And it could easily be a Levaliance cuckoo, which looks identical, but for the striping on the chest. But I think you'll find that that's a Jacobin because it is slightly smaller, if I'm not mistaken, than the Levaliance. Now, it's always a joy to see the cuckoos, of course, because they do mean that summer's here, but it's always tinged with a slight sense of resentment, as we know of their cuckolding ways. The fact that that animal will have absolutely nothing to do with raising its youngsters and that that job will be done by some hapless flock of other birds. He's still there on that tree. You still see him? He's right in front of us. Um, just if you zoom straight in over the top of my finger there. That's it. There he is. Magic Dragon Wizard, I suppose you thought you were going to trick me with this question, didn't you? You said I can, you can, uh, you said that I said that you could ask any question you wanted to ask, and your question is why is water wet? Well, I'll tell you why water is wet if you like. Water is wet because of the polar bonds that exist between the hydrogen and oxygen mole uh, atoms that make up a water molecule, and because the oxygen molecule is so much larger than the hydrogen molecule, what happens is that you have a charge basically molecule with a uh, positive charge sitting around with the two hydrogens and a negative one around the uh, the oxygen the end of the oxygen one and what that does is it makes the water stick together it gives it a very strong surface tension and that in turn makes it wet it makes it stick to you basically that is why water is wet take that magic dragon wizard <laughs> you probably knew that anyway Right, uh, so what I was going to say about this bird is that it is most large, mostly a parasite of bulbuls. Now, we don't get a lot of bulbuls here. They are around, but we don't get them quite as much as we do um, so things like babblers, for example, which the striped or levaliance cuckoo would, par would, would parasitize. Yes, so dark-eyed bulbul, speckled nast bird, fork-tailed drongo, they will also parasitize. Uh, African fly, southern chigra, southern boo-boo, bock mackery, fiscal flycatcher, terrestrial brown bull, cape white-eyed chestnut, vented tit babbler, cape wagtail, and golden-breasted bunting, many of which we do get here. And that beastly bird over there, joyful as it is as a harbinger of the coming warmth and rain, it is, as I say, tinged with a sense of resentment that I look at such a bird, which will have nothing to do with raising its own babies. Yes, Gary, maybe not so much more active, but they will certainly become more vocal uh, as we head towards the breeding season. Tremendously exciting time of the year as the greenery comes and the insects start to emerge, so there's more to eat, and the birds prepare for breeding. The weavers will start weaving 
the cuckoos will start calling, the, and all the rest of the birds will set up their little territories and try and attract mates, and the whole process of making new birds uh, will begin. And that, of course, starts with a lot more singing. So although they're not more active in, from a foraging point of view, because if they still have to forage in the winter, uh, they will certainly seem to be more active because they will be a lot more vocal. And, of course, there will be a lot more for them to eat with all the insects about and the odd fruit and that sort of thing. All righty, we are going to go back across to David Gatambagitu up in the Masi Mara. He is the only person in the world, of course, who can say the words Masi Mara in his unique and wonderful way. Well, James talking about Nyalas. Nyalas are antelopes that we do not have here in East Africa. I think you get to see Nyalas maybe from Tanzania, which is a country south of Kenya, moving further down, Zimbabwe, Mozambique, maybe all the way to South Africa. But we do not have any Nyalas specifically so in Kenya. Now, these two lionesses have come together. They have been laying down like 10 meters apart. But I'm sure we all know of all the social cuts, the lions are top on the list. They'll always groom each other. And this being two sisters could be the time now to come close and speak of the devil. Just see how close all social lions can be. Hello, sister. I've always wondered when they groom each other like that, do they talk? Do they pass any message? But I would not know, but definitely I think there's a lot of, uh, you know, feeling language that goes on between them. So the one laying down there is what we call the kink tail. She seems to be a bit sleepy, enjoying snooze, which is very characteristic of all lions or most cats. So many lion prides in the Mara Triangle, but to me, this is the most successful one, and I've always noticed they're always very good looking physically. And any time they go for hunts, you notice lions are not very successful hunters. But this particular pride, when you look at uh, lions maybe being only 30, 40 percent successful on when they make the hunt, I would give the sausage tree pride about 50 percent success. For those who have never joined us before, very good to hear. A uh, very warm welcome. And to all of you, I'll say thank you so very much. And uh, I say Asante Sana. I'm sure you all know Asante Sana translates to thank you very much for welcoming me back. I feel very warm to be welcomed by all of you. And I was talking earlier of Hawaii. Oh, for those of us who have never joined us before, this particular pride of lions we call it the Sausage Tree Pride. For fast viewers, a very big welcome. And it's because we have noticed they tend to climb on trees. And most cats, especially lions, they'll come climb on trees either to get, you know, to cool themselves up because it's much cooler with all the branch cover. Or sometimes if there's a lot of flies on the ground, they also tend to go up on trees. And there's one particular tree that they choose to go up, which is the sausage tree. Ah, so they're stretching and walking there. And because they love going up the sausage trees, that's why we ended up giving them the name the Sausage Tree Pride. So I was talking earlier of their success when they go hunting. So this particular pride is very successful. It consists of four females, and one of the females have two small little cubs, I would say two to three months now. And I'm just hoping at one point I'm going to spot it. So that is the kink tail. If you look at her tail carefully, you see it has a little kink. And this one will always guarantee, especially myself, 100%, because sometimes lions from a distance might confuse you which one is which one, but this one particular mark on the tail is very definite. That belongs to the Sausage Tree Pride. So the sister is heading out in a particular direction where I had seen some buffaloes earlier, and I doubt the two of them would dare to bring a buffalo down the migration is still on, and chances are they would go for a wildebeest. And today I think it's a lucky day for all of us. We've got my cats here, but I think Sydney might be having a more interesting cut in South Africa.
I have got one of the lovely cats. This is my favorite cat. Tingana is right under a very nice shade here from one of the green trees. I can see that this uh, lead wood has now just recovered. It's just green everywhere. It's very much difficult to see this cat in the middle of these trees. Look at that. So this is Tingana who is now just about uh, six meters or less away from the kill. I can see the impala hanging as well from here where I am at the moment. Look at that. That is what he is here for. He is here trying to finish his impala. It was a male impala. And my apologies for the uh, roof uh, as it is drizzling here in the area since this morning. So I've got my roof so that the equipment can be safe. So you will be uh, having problems with the poles during the sightings. My apologies in advance for that. So I can't even see the stomach, but uh, from what I saw from the kill, I can tell that this cat, the stomach is full at the moment. And he's just getting everything nearby. He's not very far away from the Galago pen. He's just about 120, 110 meters away. So everything is here. So I don't know the reason why this cat is hiding under this bush, because it's not sunny at all. Maybe it's because of the rain. I can smell the impala, that meat smells very nice. So this cat had a very nice meal. And Rosalind, the lepers can hear very, very well. And they can hear up to four to seven times more than we do. So their hearing abilities are very good. So that's why the male lepers, the territorial holders, when they are doing sowing, the other ones, the intruders, and the other ones coming to challenge for their territories can hear them from very far. So in terms of kilometers, I'm not too sure, but it can travel kilometers. So I like it a lot when Tingana is sowing. It's quite a very lovely sound. You can see this cat is so camouflaged. You can't even see where the head is uh, unless it's moving. You can see the blink of the eyes there. So the go away birds has just arrived now. Look at that. So this animal has got a very good eyesight. You can see that people is nice and clear. So now let's go back to the Masai Mara where David has got the lions. I will be here with a spotted cat. Well, Tingana remains one of my favorite uh, leopards to have seen in South Africa and truly I think he remains the Duke of Juma but now the lioness here has moved like what 20-30 meters towards the one that moved earlier and they're now like five meters apart or six meters yeah five six meters apart looking the direction I was talking about where I had seen some buffaloes before but chances are I highly doubt two of them would even dare to go for a buffalo, even a youngster. After all the spitting or small little drizzles we had earlier, what will happen, I'm sure they are all wet and they might try to dry themselves a little bit or maybe just curl themselves and just keep the warmth, not to lose so much body heat because all the showers that were raining, they did not move to try to get some shade or some shelter rather. So this one's quite, quite sleepy. Been trying to think what direction I would go and get the other female that forms four of this pride that have the two cubs. But I think because of the rains that just started the other day, which marks the beginning of the short rains in Kenya, she might have chosen an area where it rains 
Either she'll stay in some cave or under some rocks or crevices where the cubs will not be rained on. Apart from, you know, having big mortalities of, you know, lion cubs from, I would say, I would say hunger, it's more of weather. Chantal, how are you? And I'll tell you, they do, they do, because uh, mange is very typical with most cats and more lions than the other cats. But I tell you, Chantal, I do not remember. I'm just trying to walk back, my clock back. All my years have been in the bush, Chantal, and I haven't seen not only one pride, I haven't seen a single lion or a single lioness with mange. Maybe Archie. I don't know whether Archie is going to give you so much pressure. Give me an answer. Have you seen anyone lion? Archie also, who is my camera operator today, says he hasn't seen and I also think he hasn't had. And that could be a very big point, Chantel, to discuss and talk about. Why so much? Because there's the stick pride that I saw when I was in Juma in South Africa that had mange. And then also had there's another pride of lions also in the same area or that, you know, the bigger part of the the western fringe of the Kruger National Park called the Nukuhumas also that also had mange. I don't know when it was, but when the sticks had mange, oh no, it was there like three, four months ago. I saw that and I would ask maybe my colleagues, you know, or my other fellow guides, James and Sydney, why why would it be that, you know, in South Africa they get more mange than where we are. I mean, going across, I'm not very far from Tanzania in uh, a national park called Serengeti, very close from here. And many years also I used to work there. I don't remember having seen any lion pride or any one lion, be it male or female, with mange. So I do not know. I'm trying to think, you know, the parasites, the mites, or the ticks that, of course, that transmit the vectors of mange. Why do, are they more active there? Is there a particular weakness of the lionesses there? But the good news, Chantal, they always recover and they survive. We're just looking at these two lionesses here, which has unfortunately gone flat, flat, Chantal. And again, just to answer your question one more time, I don't remember having seen any mange cases in East Africa. Time to nap. And so interesting, the grass there is still pretty wet. Of all the showers that have going, been going on, but you can see the skin twitches. Not because of any fly, it could be more of a leaf flex. Also for the ears, also flick. And earlier when we got here and we missed these lionesses, I was asking Archie, should anybody just decide to come out and stretch here? You might get a big shock just when any one of them would put her head up. See how they blend in very well. Not sure, Archie, if you can pan way in front there that direction there we can see the buffaloes i was talking about well done archie archie hogs had very good eyes so it's those buffaloes that led us to these lionesses but if you look at them carefully they're not looking at us they're looking at those two lionesses but they could see them when they were still flat there but apparently me and archie could not see anything and i told archie those buffaloes must be looking at something well james henry is still driving around not sure what he is up to Well, what we're up to is we've come past that dead Nyala and it has miraculously disappeared. Initially, I thought it must be Lazarus the Nyala, but it is not, in fact, Lazarus the Nyala. It was uplifted by the Sabi Sand. We're going to go and take it away and test it for disease, possibly anthrax. Well, that's what they're going to look for. I don't think it's anthrax. You got it. You're in, it's in the middle of frame. There we go, everybody. A little bee eater. I'm not just saying that because it is a small bee-eater. Its name is the little bee-eater. One of four bee-eater species that we get here. And this one, the only permanently resident one here. The white-fronted, in theory, is resident here, but I've seldom seen one. Isn't he lovely? I did hear the European bee-eater flying overhead the other day. Toop, 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 toop. Toop, 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 is what it was doing. This little fellow is wagging his tail because he's happy to see us. 
That, of course, is rubbish. I don't think he cares a jot that we are here. My favourite part of the little bee eater is that little blue eye shadow that they have. It really, you can't believe that nature has imbued it with such a detailed little colour pattern. And obviously the light is not great at the moment, but their light, you know, in the full sun, they just look so gorgeous. Barb, you say you love these little birds? They are so beautiful? Yes, they are. They come from a whole family of beautiful birds. All the bee eaters are stunning. It's not a slow bird, that, is it? It's like a little rocket. Uh, Nikita, yes, bee eaters do migrate. That particular bee eater does not migrate. It stays here. That's why I said it was resident. Uh, European bee eaters, unsurprisingly, go to everybody at the same time. Yes, correct. Well done. They go to Europe. The carmine bee eater is a, an intra-African migrant, so it goes up and down in Africa. And the white-fronted, I think, is more nomadic than it is migratory, if I'm not mistaken. I don't think it disappears overseas. So the only Palearctic one is the European bee eater. And I remember seeing them, actually, in Italy when I was there last year, about 16 months ago. Uh, we saw little bee, at least European bee eaters, in the countryside of Umbria, which uh, was a very nice sort of taste of home, if you like. I'm just waving friendly at some people. I've heard nothing on the radio of great import or interest, so hopefully we'll have something to show you after Sydney has showed you Tingana again. I can see that Tingana is now starting to have some visitors. There is two hyenas at the moment who are coming very close to the kill. We might see some activities here in a short while. I can see these hyenas are all communicating and they are sniffing up in the air. They are very sure that there is food around here. Look at that. So this is one of those animals with a very good sense of smell. They can detect a kill five kilometers away just from the sense of smell. Look at that. I'm not too sure if they know that uh, Tingana is around here. Uh, Karen, Tingana and Hosanna, they don't really uh, go after these animals every day. So the thing is, the cats, predators are just very opportunistic and uh, they have got an instinct behavior of just killing animals. Normally, they kill something and eat for a couple of days and they will hunt after four or five days. But if anything comes their way, you will see they will take it down, even when having a kill. So you can see that uh, these hyenas, they are looking for an opportunity. I can see another one is coming to join. So maybe they might be able to jump because I can see the gap between the ground and the carcass which is hanging by the tree. It's not that very big. If these hyenas comes here, maybe one of them can be able to jump and drag the piece. We might see something interesting here this afternoon. He's not worried at all. You can see he's very much relaxed there in between. We can see this highness nicely. He just looks, he just looks very tired. So you can see the spots now as a as part of the predatory strategies that these spots can be able to camouflage these animals because it looks exactly the same like this bush at the moment. I hope he's gonna wake up, go up and have something to eat. We want to see him eating today. I haven't seen this cat for a long time. <laughs> including my final control, Lou, as well, is missing uh, this uh, leopard. He 
He is thinking too much. I can see now he's moving the head and the eyes. <laughs> and yes, yes, the hyenas and the cats, they sleep much longer. And when they wake up, they prefer they to yawn. But yawning uh, serve different purposes. They also use yawning in order to cool the temperature up by the brain. So you must check every time the lions, when they're lying down, they keep, they keep yawning. When they're doing that, that is when they're cooling the temperature up by the brain. <laughs> And it does help them a lot. So hyenas as well, because of sleeping a lot of hours, they must have to do that. So now let's go to the Masai Mara and see Dave with his lions and see what the lions are up to. Well, it's very typical for most cats just to lay flat and uh, not do much. Uh, maybe like Tingana, but the same case here with my two lionesses and the one behind there, that's the kink tail. And I've always compared these two lionesses and as much as this one has little kinky tail, she is more in charge, I think, of this pride. Looking at her ear there, that's her right ear, you can see it got a little tear which sometimes is because of the edge and the times when you try to edge some of these cuts we look at the tear marks they got either from fights and we also look on their teeth how yellowy they are so you can see kink has a tear there we're trying to come to the other one that he doesn't have a name see whether he you notice that clearly has very solid round ears maybe a slight tear down there or be, you know between they are not like the one on Kinky. You can see the breathing there, it's very slow. And you can see one of her mammary glands, or one of her inguinos is out there. They don't seem to have any sarcomax, meaning either, you know, they don't have any caps, these two, or they don't look swollen to me, an indication that I would say maybe she is pregnant. I don't see any sign of that. But what is happening now, the migration is still on here in the Mara Triangle and we got thousands and thousands of wildebeest. So I just think they're just full. But one of the sisters in this pride is the one that I said earlier has two cubs, which has been my big mission today to see whether I could see her. And I'm wondering between and these two is long one. And remember what I requested you earlier, that your questions and comments are always very, very active. So If it was a hot day, you could have seen the panting on that tummy there, but this is very slow, it's just like no more breathing. Uh, sorry, Dan, do what have the same structure? Sorry, Lou. Uh, Diane, very good, very good. Uh, I would say yes or no, depending on how. Oops, what a big yawn there. Are you waking up? Do you want to move? That's the kink tail, for those who have never joined us before, and quite a very good stretch there. Diane, unlike hyenas, lions have a little bit different structure. You can't say there's one in charge, but when you look at the lion's clans, I just want to go into either have a groom on each other. When you look, Diane, at the hyenas and look at their social structure, they're very matriarchal. And of all the females in the group, of all the females in the clan, there'll be one female that will be top. She is in charge of everything. She is way top there. I'm not sure to call her a president, but she's very top there. So lions may not have that. They may have what you call a pathfinder of like the two here. What a good role they're doing. Well done. Very synchronized, eh? I would say of these two, 
I have noticed Kinky Tail will always make the decisions. When they need to go and, and hunt, she will always wake up fast and she'll move in a particular direction. She will survey Diane and she'll be like, that is our target, that is our prey. But I wouldn't say they have a social structure exactly like in hyenas where you see there's one female that is very conspicuously in charge and you can always tell who she is. We have a particular clan here that we call the North Clan in the Mara Triangle and they have one leader who we call the Wafus and she got a collar because we got some people who have been researching on her. But even if you'd remove that collar on Wafus, you definitely tell she is very in charge. She controls the whole clan and you know she pulls all the calls and she makes all the important decisions. Hello there. Time for play. Yes, and quite a good snuggle there for these two female lionesses of the sausage tree pride. I'm sure because of the temperatures going down, what they may be trying to do apart from the social grooming is to raise the body temperatures because it has massively cooled off. You see, looking at this one, I was talking about the tear marks or the ear marks or the tears on the ears, not the tears. This one looks very solid. All the ears look very rounded, not having a single tear. Unlike on the kinky, that we saw had one big tear on the right ear. It's the kink tail there, I guess. And she's the one having a tear. Now, they're looking in a different direction, not where the buffaloes were. How playful, and I think Diane was asking about the social structures of lions and hyenas, and maybe Sydney might put more light on the same. I've got the two hyenas right now here. They are trying to sip everything, so they're just eating all this small piece of meat lying on the ground. So it seems like when Tingana was feeding this morning, some of the small pieces were just falling to the ground. I can see these hyenas are not even challenging each other. They are getting something, all of them. Not only one of them is dominating. They are giving each other's chance. So these hyenas are just about a few meters away from where Tingana is and I have seen that none of them is aware about the presence of Tingana at the moment. Andy, they do try, it's just that the hyenas are not well gifted. They are not agile climbers like the cats. The leopards are well equipped and they can easily climb up into a tree. Hyenas is a very difficult exercise unless that tree is very close to the ground. But if you look at the gap now between the hyenas and the meat hanging, it's not that much. If this hyenas tries to jump, maybe they can have a chance and drag that uh, piece which is hanging there now. So the social structure of the hyenas is very much interesting because the females, they are having high ranks whereas the males have got low ranks and these females, if you look at them, they have got quite a lot of uh, testosterone. So they develop quite a lot of male genes which helps them in order to protect the den against the intruders. So it's unlike the elephants whereby it is a matriarchal system and you find the responsible female in charge of the head when it comes to direction, uh, for direction and orientation, she's responsible when to sleep and when to go to the water holes. But here has got quite a lot with dominance in order to protect the babies and the, the clan. So you can see that one is having something hanging there. Maybe it's from the intestine. Look, one of the hyenas is walking very, very close to where the, the cat is resting at the moment. He was just about two meters away. So you can see that this cat is not interested on in chasing these hyenas. He knows very well that the food is safe at the moment, they're not going to do anything. 
they are searching everywhere. So that one is even sniffing uh, the trees there. So it means that is where this cat has been climbing from. So from sniffing, they can get quite a lot of information. They even know that this cat was here not long time ago. It's a pity this, these animals cannot be able to climb this tree. So hyenas, they also conduct their own hunting, but it's not very often. Here they are depending on the remains from the leopards and the lions. Also the wild dogs. So now while we are waiting to see what is going to happen here with these hyenas and Tingana, let's go to Chitwa Chitwa Dam and see what James is having at the moment. Well, what we have here is a great conflagration of Egyptian geese that are flying towards us at a tremendous rate, shouting the odds. No idea what they're going on about, why they're in such profusion here, and why they have now just all departed en masse. How oh, very strange. There's still some more there. Maybe it was a wedding or something, and the wedding's now over. And all of the guests have left, leaving the happy couple and the drunk best man behind. <laughs> Come on, George. It's time to go home now. Oh, all right. I suppose it's time I moved on. You know Jacinda went home with the other groomsmen. Don't worry, George, you're an eligible young man. They're the parents of the bride coming down to have a drink now. All the bridesmaids have gone home with other eligible young men, and poor old George, he's but fat, you see, he's been left on his own. Shame. They're the parents coming down for one last drink. There we go. Oh dear, I think it was the most marvellous celebration. Yes, indeed, my love. Our daughter looked positively radiant. Oh, she did. She was just gorgeous. We did such a good job of raising her, didn't we? Oh, yes, we did, my love. Yes. Made the last comment on loving seeing Egyptian geese flying overhead. It was most impressive. Jacqueline, yes, indeed. They are magnificent to watch. You see, poor George really is overstaying his welcome now. The happy couple is trying to go off towards the bridal suite. Roger, tell him to go away. I can't tell him to go away. He's my best friend. But, Roger, this is our night. You guys going to have another drink now? Roger, no. him. I could have another drink. Poor old George. Sad state of affairs for him. Very happy. Now well, maybe that's his problem, Louise. Maybe he got his face in the in the wedding cake. Louise says he's got a very white face. I have to agree, he does have quite a white face. He probably headbutted the cake by mistake, which is maybe why the bride isn't too partial to him. Look at him, he really doesn't know how to leave them be, does he? He's, he's a big fellow. He's just behind you. Almost certainly not, Louise. He didn't used to date the bride, but he's always wanted to date the bride. That much is clear. That's why he's looking at her longingly with the equivalent of Egyptian goose lust in his eyes. And sorrow, of course, because he's had, well, three or four too many, I think, at this stage. Look how awkward he is. It's the happy couple whispers about him. Well, Louise, I agree with you. He does look more buff than the groom, doesn't he? 
It might be that he's been drinking too much beer, though, and maybe it's not so much buffness as a sort of a swelling of... Maybe it shouldn't be swelling, if you know what I mean, uh, where some Egyptian geese have a six-pack, he's got a keg. Or a cooler box, yes, exactly, with a six-pack in it. Anyway, that's obviously all rubbish, everybody. I'm not actually suggesting there was really an Egyptian goose wedding here at Chitwa Dam. Although it's a nice thought, I think. It is a very good, good venue for a wedding. Yes, well done, Louise. It is indeed. There are lots of hippopotami here. I haven't been here for a very long time. I feel like I haven't been here for months and months, and that's because during our Gauntlet TV series, I was searching for the leopards all the time on Juma, Hosana, Tandi, Tlalamba, and Tingana, and I didn't come down here at all. That particular hippopotamus has got a rather hippopotamus has got a severe outbreak of skin biting or scratchings. I wonder what's happened there. It doesn't look like it's been inflicted by a, another hippo. It does look quite nasty. Well, maybe it was inflicted by another hippo. Clearly not flavour of the month, that hippopotamus. It was quite vicious. They all sort of attacked him or her. Maybe a young bull. There's a dolphin there. Yeah, I, I was sort of didn't want to be over dramatic, Seb, but I, I agree with you. Seb was just saying to him it looked like claw marks from a lion. Now, I don't think that's out of the realms of possibility at all. They did look like thin, sharp scratches. So maybe he or she was set upon by a lion. Why the rest should be so nasty, I don't know. Yeah, it did look like a mosaic, Louise. Perhaps the lion or lions nearly got him or her. Let's do a little bit of ornithology. No, let's not. Let's stay there. See what happens. The dolphin came up again. To many people, that is the sound of the African wilderness to them when they go on holiday to the bush. That's what they like to fall asleep to at night, and it is a lovely sound. Certainly for me, much more so than the ultimately cliched sound of the African fish eagle. Very nice. Then there was an arts... No, there it is. Sebastian, I'm sorry to trouble you. Yeah. But there is a pied wagtail down there, which is quite nice to see. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Got him. Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> no, you're in the right place. Uh, back a bit from there. There you are. Left a bit. Yeah, that's him. There's the pied wagtail. Pied, black and white, wagtail, because it is, yes, wagging its tail. I think they look like such happy birds. Well, running this bird is, but fly it can. Running the bird is that David Katamba Gitu has, but fly. It cannot. Well, I'll be requesting Lou in the final control to ask for me either from James or Sydney what happened to the mysterious uh, Egyptian or the gooselings that disappeared at one point. I don't know what came of them, but we got a different bird here, and I would say, you know, different in this sense. This is the largest bird, I would say, in the world. 
and it's different in the sense that it's the only bird that I know of in Africa that does not fly. This is the Masai ostrich and we all know they have very very clear sexual dimorphism between males and females. Females always being greyish in colour and I'm sure she's feeding on some seeds there from the grass. Pick, one, two, pick, swallow, pick, pick, up, look for safety, make sure you're okay or look for a mate. This is a great comment, first time you have seen an ostrich on the show and I'm very happy for you, enjoy it, enjoy seeing it, Jessene. And it's pretty special to see an ostrich because, uh, again, it's a very unique bird. Look at the size of that massive bird and if it's going to put one of its wings up, especially on the left one, you can see the huge drumstick they got. And I'm sure you might have heard of the proverb you're saying that ostriches will always bury their heads in the sand and it comes from the, their massive size you see they're very large birds and you imagine trying to put the small head in the sand there and the whole body remains exposed out I don't know what attention she must have picked attention of something the only concern like where we are either could be lions and not anybody else or any other animal but either way they don't want to take any chances but again, as I said earlier, the migration is still very on in the Mara Triangle. Chances are the lions would not bother coming for ostriches. They have a lot to eat, wide selection of food, and the wildebeest are just doing them lots of good on their menu. Some of the largest, I mean the heaviest birds. So when you see males, if you might be like to see one, they're black and white. Versus Bunny, you'll get ostriches are uh, rather unique birds. You'll get both males and females sitting on their eggs before they hatch out. And what I found out during the day, the females will always be sitting on the eggs and the males will swap and do that at night. So yes, both sexes here, males and females, will sit on their eggs. And I've seen more often than not the females doing that during the day and the males at night and maybe the argument or the reasoning behind that would be the females will tend to blend in very well at the ground and you know the brown color they got and the males may be blending better at night and when that happens then they'll swap in terms of eating you know if the females are on the eggs during the day and the males at night then during the day you get the males eating more and when they swap you'll get the females tending to feed more at night than during the day very good meat they got not anymore I mean long time ago like in the village they come from we used to hunt them not anymore and you get they have very huge drumsticks and most dietitians have said ostrich got very lean meat we still got so many farms of ostriches all over the world all over the world including kenya and the dietitians will say they got very lean meat and people who have very high cholesterols have been advised if they have to eat meat they go to ostrich farms and buy themselves some pounds of ostrich meat a friend of mine was joking to me saying the females have less less cholesterol than the males and yeah Lou in the final control agrees with me that you know the ostriches got very nice meat personally you know anytime I end up in a restaurant where they've been allowed to serve ostrich meat I'll always eat you know ostrich and I tend to prefer ostrich meat to chicken not for any particular reason but I think they're very lean and tasty but when you look at both uh, in terms of colors the ostrich meat is more red in color than the chicken very fast birds in speed and the first defense if they're in any concern is to just flight and they fly low very fast just like the cheetahs they could comfortably do 50 60 miles an hour but if they get cornered they'll always turn around I mean before they turn around they kick very hard 
ostrich ostriches. I am not sure I have heard of leopards going for ostriches. Lions do? Sydney, do, os do leopards go for ostriches? <laughs> I haven't seen the leopard hunting the ostrich, but I have seen the cheetah taking down an ostrich before. I have witnessed that kind of exciting cats. They do take uh, chances and kill the ostriches. You can see now here Tingana is resting and nothing is happening and the hyenas which were here earlier on also got disappeared. So I'm sure this cat ate quite a lot uh, this morning. So what I'm going to do now is that I'm going to leave him here, go and look for something else and come back again afterwards. Maybe he will decide to eat afterwards. You can see he looks very much tired at the moment. Or maybe he has been to the water hole already. Nikita, Osana is what I'm going to be looking for now. And there is no sign at all around here about the presence of Osana in the area. So it's also very difficult for me to do trekking today because the, the rain is killing all the tracks. So it's very much difficult. But I'm going to go up towards Treehouse Dam where Osana was last seen drinking and see if we can find something. We might be lucky around there. So I can, I can hear that the rain is just about to come back again. Now it's drizzling. <laughs> Maybe also Tingana might go back to the tree bushes there and hide for a while. So now let's go back to James. James has got some bad nest at the moment. There's a bird in that nest, everybody. And I'm just warning you that we are being troubled by a bit of rain at the moment so I'm not sure how long we're going to remain uncovered. We came out without our roof on because it was looking a bit brighter. Uh, but there is a bird there you can see the tail behind the branch on the left hand side so there's a mother bird of some sort sitting on some eggs there which I think is very exciting. You can just see a little bit of white fluff there I don't think that's a baby bird it's probably just coming up from the mum. Isn't that cool? Yes. I mean, not the most spectacular sighting we've ever had, but it is interesting. I don't know what it is. I'm going to guess that it's a Gymnogene or African Harrier Hawk. Let me just go a little bit around the corner. Now you can see the tail of the bird sticking out. Can you see it there, Seb? Down. I'm not sure I can. There we go. What do you think, Gymnogene? Let's go with Gymnogene. Ooh, that's nasty. Terrifying. Have to put our covers on, I'm afraid. All right, let us head across to Sidders and we'll cover up and see you uh, shortly. I am now heading towards the Galagopen area where I am hoping to begin with my trekking that side by the dam, but the rain is coming back now, which is not bad. Rain is what I'm looking for. The vegetation is very dry. It needs this rain. So there is no sign of animal activities here. Maybe when we get to the pen, we might be lucky when we're there. Oh, I saw another interesting animal. <laughs> Look at him there. So this animal just woke up very early today. 
Look at that. So that's a beautiful scrub hair. You can see the translucent ears and the white patch underneath the tail. You know what I like about scrub hair is how they choose partners. All the males, they got invited to come to an area where they must have to demonstrate their kicking and boxing. And sometimes the brides, the females who are, who are supposed to be chosen, they get injured because some of these males, they give heavy kicks and they can even, can even kick the brides. <laughs> that is quite a very interesting ceremony. So look at that. So you can see these animals, when they are sitting on that tail, when they're sitting on that tail, the predators won't see them. But when running away, they lift it up. So it just got disappeared now. We are going to carry on now and see what we are going to find next. Uh, Riti, I did, did get your question very nicely. If uh, Lou can repeat that question for me. So now we are not yet there by the heavy rain season. We are getting there. So it's shortly after spring. And uh, now by end of October is when we are going to start having the heavy rains. But now with the changes here in southern africa with regards to the climate change heavy rains are coming much more in december and other areas mid-december towards end of december and january they are still receiving heavy rains so it must have to rain hard so that the grass can be convinced and starts to bring back the nutrition for these animals. So now let's go back to the Maasai Mara where David is driving to try and find something interesting for you this afternoon. Well done, Sydney. Hopefully you're going to also see or find Hosanna. Hosanna was my very first leopard to see. So Hosanna was my first leopard to see when I was in South Africa. Now, I might be coming very close to a herd of elephants, which I've not seen elephants since they came back. I've been away and off maybe, as I said, or as you all welcomed me, I've been away for about two weeks. And I'm always excited anytime I see elephants. And Archie, you let me know when I've given you a good angle. Archie is very particular on how I park the car. And sometimes he will always listen to me, David. I want the car in this particular angle. Can you level the car before I level my camera? And it's always good to see Ellie's. Any day I see elephants, I've always said, is a good day. Because of all the big animals, Ellie's are my favorite animals. I have so many reasons to love elephants. But the main reason, or the main one is, an elephant will always keep you engaged. Engaged in the sense that an elephant, unlike lions, which are always exciting or leopard to see, the moment cats choose to be flat, that's it. But I don't remember a flat elephant in my life. Eating, drinking, moving, playing, you know, having a social a bonding, name it. This could be a young female, then a youngster to the right. But very interesting, if you move up to the right, I want to take you the way. It's huge tree, exactly. That tree, it's a very iconic tree of the Mara. And unlike the thorn tree, this fig tree, and look how beautiful that setting is. Actually, I want to thank you very much for your good camera work. Beautiful background in the sky. And beautiful, you know, great tree there. Actually, it's just laughing back there. Leah, thank you very much for that comment. And I think me and you are on the same boat, that Ellie's are your favorite, Leah. And yes, 
who would not love to see alleys? We've got about 10 of them here or so, but on every HUD or, or any, watch, any one of them you look, they would be doing something. I thought that at one point she was nursing. But Lea, look, I mean, pooping is also part of it. So an elephant, oops, one, two, and the drop. So Lea, yes, Ellie's will always be doing something and I'm happy that you're favorite. So me and you, we have a commonality there. Is it time to nurse for that young one there? Yes, and I'm sure maybe a few of you might ask nursing what and nursing why. So Ellie's, the females of the cows, are very different from all the other animals. Rosalind, the big boys would weigh up to six tons. I'm talking of big males, up to five tons. We have seen that up to six tons in weight. And the girls could be anything between 3,000 to 3,500 kilograms. So elephants are some of the largest, I would say, the heaviest weighing animals, Rosalind. And even that baby, Rosalind, you see there, at birth, don't be surprised, they're born say 100 kilos or over 200 to 240 pounds in weight you would imagine carrying such a heavy baby for like two years eh? so the females are anything 3,000 3,500 uh, kilos three and a half tons or so and the males 5.5 sometimes going up to six tons in weight some of the animals I would say I've known or the cows carrying the heaviest babies for such a long time. So carrying such a heavy baby for two months is quite an investment. This cow behind, they're very matriarchal elephants, I would say. We're talking about hyenas earlier, and Ellie's also are very matriarchal. We'll always have one lead female in every herd of elephants. And in general, it's always the oldest, not the biggest or the largest in size, but the oldest. The oldest meaning two youngsters they are lagging behind. The oldest meaning they have a lot of experience, they have been there, they have seen it, so they will always know where to go, where not to, when to drink, what direction to go into. And when you spend more time with them, you'll always very easily pick the lead female or the matriarch. Well, I would say once the babies are born, before they get to, you know, getting pregnant, they would nurse for anything a year to two, I'm trying to imagine, a year to two, before elephants, you know, conceive and get another baby. But I'm trying to guess it's about maybe one year to two years nursing. That would be an average time for the, I would say, the African elephant or the savannah elephant to nurse their young ones. And if you look carefully, they are bare. they'll always try to keep their calves in the middle. Very clever animals. And that doesn't have any tusks as yet. Meaning that she is definitely uh, less than two years in age. We have used elephant tusks just to edge them up or to have a rough idea how old they could be. Very majestic animals. I remember my lecturer in college was telling me if any of you ask you the difference between an African elephant and an Asian elephant, look on the ear. The African elephant, the shape of the ear, looks like an African map. And the Asian elephant, the ear, take the shape of an Asian map. Thank you, Archie, for showing the viewers that. And it is true when you look at that carefully. I mean, the other important differences between the African elephant and the Asian elephant, but that was just on the side. But if you look at both males and females of our elephants here, they'll have tusks on them. But the Asian elephants, the females, do not have tusks. In general, ours are much bigger in size. And I would still say they're very natural or they're as, as wild as they've been from day one. And looking at the Asiatic elephants, you'll see or notice they've been used or they use them to do some suckers, or they use them in farms uh, to do a bit of uh, work in the farm. But here, none of them is used for anything. And and I, Roshni, I agree with you 100%. I mean, uh, I have not been out with Archie for quite some time, but we make a very good gel. And some of the staff Roshni bring you, be it the lions, 
the elephant, nice tree there that we saw in the fig tree and the background of the sky, Roshni, thank you very much. We tend to get along with Archie very well and uh, when I was training as a guide before, Archie was my main guy and he used to take me out and he would teach me all the secrets of making sure the viewers get happy. Our elephants have moved on and it could be time for us also to move on and find out what could be ahead of us. Archie, are you happy to move on? Archie says, move on. Alrighty. So not thinking of looking for my female lioness with the two cubs of the sausage pride tree because it's getting a bit dark now. But again, tomorrow I'll be out in the same area and uh, we'll be finding out if we'll be lucky to see it. Definitely believing she is not very far from the other two that we saw earlier and lions tend to be very social. She'll be sitting very close, close. Well, we had some rains earlier here, but I think Sydney might be getting a test of the same. <laughs> yeah, it is now raining. The rain is accelerating a little bit now. I can feel that the, now is better than this morning. So this vegetation is going to get very excited. Oh, it's already excited, I'm sure. So I hope it rains non-stop all night long. So I am heading much more towards the tree house dam area to see if we can find a different cat. So the tree house dam is catering for the cats such as uh, Okumori and Hosanna has been spotted there and also Umfokazi, that is the area where I saw him a few weeks ago. So I'm hoping to be lucky with one of those cats. Paula, in summer, the best that we are seeing the most here in Juma, it is the lilac breasted roller. I'm talking about one of those interesting bears, the best that will always attract your eyesight. The lilac breasted roller is the best that on every drive I am seeing it. And it's one of the special bears because in some of the African countries, it's even regarded as a national bird. So it's one of the common residents. So some of these birds, they go away from Africa. These different types of migration. There's something called palliatic migration, where these birds live all the way to Europe. And we have got the intra-migration, which is just taking place within the same continent. They East, north, south, east, west. And we also got the altitudinal migration, those birds who are just moving from high altitude to the low altitude. So the lilac breasted rollers, they seem having enough food available during the dry season because they don't go anywhere. <laughs> you see now, David, my colleague in Mara, just confirmed that the lilac breasted roller is the national bird of Kenya. It has got quite a lot of uh, beautiful colors. It's one of my favorite birds. I like it the most when uh, is, they are displaying themselves for mating activities when they go high up and form the acrobatic flight and land as if they're going to hit the ground. Linda, 
Uh, here by my vehicle, you can see this vehicle has got some uh, rain covers on. So that's why earlier on I had to apologize uh, for the poles. So here the equipment and the guys and the camera operators, we are very safe at the moment. So we are not worried about this rain at all. We are very, very well equipped. So I can see that this rain is uh, fascinating all the different species because the animals that feed on grass, I cannot see them at all. And the, the browsers, I only saw one giraffe when I started. So all these animals are excited about this kind of weather. So I'm sure this is way much better than the sun because it does get very hot in this area. So when the, the rain is like this, this is going to also activate quite a lot of insects. So the insects such as the termites will start to extend their buildings now because it's getting wet now so they will easily get the mud. So now let's go to uh, Dave in the Masai Mara and see what David is having at the moment. Any time you go to a place with water, I've always believed, and we all know, water is life. So the treehouse dam, you know, with water there, Sydney could be lucky to see something. But here we are being lucky to see the sun going down. But we have all the signs of a very huge storm coming either later tonight. It's very windy at the moment. But that's beautiful sky. And these are the beauties of being in Africa. And you'd imagine seeing this every day in your life, eh? With what I call no visual pollution. Just a tree here and the sun trying to push it its way down up on the western horizon. And all the trees you see there are what you call the torchwood trees very iconic trees of the Mara. Sinak, Jumbo, Jumbo, and yes, that is an amazing view. I agree with you 100%. And I have never wanted to close a drive without looking at the sunset, unless, of course, we have very heavy s storms or rain, or the sunset doesn't look very colorful. But yes, Sinak, what a way to, like, you know, not end the day as yet. That's massive. I mean, that's just amazing with all the beautiful colors that you see there. To me, they're very romantic colors, and I would say they're very peaceful colors. Just watch with the heavy dark clouds hanging up there. So, all this area that you see on the foreground was covered by the wildebeest in their thousands, but if you look, the grass is very short. They have trimmed it down, they've been eating all the grass around here and have moved, I think you saw some lightning there and they've moved to a different area. So all that you see was covered by wildebeest. Excellent. What? Good, good job, Archie. You spotted something there and that is called a lilac breasted roller. We are just talking about a roller before with Lou in the final control and there is one and she is holding for her dear life because of the wind. I just said a few seconds ago that it's very windy here at the moment and I'm sure everybody believed me but anybody who might not have believed me you can now see what the Lilac Breasted Roller has all the clear message that she has to keep her delicate balance otherwise she'll be blown off because of the wind but I got a feeling it might rain any time, maybe not now, but later tonight. I've always seen strong winds, you know, blowing, 
and with such thick clouds, rains will come. So you couldn't see that, like, like Monsieur Laura Verrois. Very good. <laughs> Joy, I agree with you. I don't know whether actually will take me back to that bad there for Joy to see. And true Joy is like she is dancing. Look at her. So the wind has one big thing that's doing to her, trying to blow her out. But in the process of her trying to balance herself, Joy, I agree with you. She is like trying to dance. And I'm sure she's gripping that trunk very well, not to be blown off. Yes, I see what Joy you're talking about. She seems to be doing some a cappella dancing. What dance actually do you think that could be? Well, Archie says flamingo dance. Archie thinks that's flamingo dance. I thought of a cappella. But what? Well, as we wait to see whether our rains will come or how long this lilac breasted roller, which is the national bird of Kenya, will keep holding for her dear life before she blows off. I think David, I mean James now, have good shelter or cover on his head. I do have shelter and cover on my head. We have quite an interesting situation playing out here with a smaller but obviously more aggressive crowned lapwing having a go at two bigger but more peaceable blacksmith lapwings. They've decided to call it quits for now. Of course, every time I see a blacksmith lapwing now, I cannot but feel a slight twinge of sadness at the loss of Scubert, my first drive back. For those of you who don't know, Scubert was a young bird that we watched from egg all the way to over the age when he should have been fledging. So he was about to fledge, he was about to fly properly, and you know, he had a 20% chance of making it. And suddenly, uh, you know, with, with probably less than 24 hours before he f would fly, he was killed by something. You don't know what it was, may have been the cold snap, may have been an elephant that stomped on him. Anyway, I felt very sad afterwards. Anyway, that's what happens with the blacksmith lapwing. And all of you, of course, shared my sadness. Of course you did. You all watched him and enjoyed him as much as I did. So we've come back, we've put our roof on. The clouds are scudding overhead. You may just be able to hear the gentle pitter-patter of rain. And it obviously does reduce the amount that we can show you, but that's okay. We'll still have good conversation. There's some red-breasted swallows flying overhead as well. I think there are quite a few insects emerging out onto quarantine clearings. There were lots and lots of red-breasted swallows. You might just be able to hear them. I'll shut up for a second. Do you hear that? Those are the red-breasted swallows flying overhead. Not normally in big flocks, but obviously there are a lot of insects emerging with the heat and the moisture. And soon too will come the greening vegetation. And a quarantine sand pit will turn into a rich grazing ground. I wonder if these are Scubert's parents, having left the traumatic place that is the Juma Pan for them. I'll just be looking for little insects and crustaceans and things. See, Naka, it could have been buffalo, we're not sure. May have been buffalo, could have been elephants, could have been a cold snap and then been stood on by something else. You're right. Scubert is no longer. Righty, let's move on from here. You can see I'm wearing this very fine rain accoutrement. The, uh, the black one that I'm wearing underneath this proved to be as porous as loo paper. It has absorbed the water very effectively and then transferred it through 
onto my other jacket, which in turn transferred it onto my skin with a great effectiveness. I felt like I was having a shower, in fact. <laughs> yes. It is amazing to me, as I've said to many of you before, how one can buy a plastic bag for 20 cents, 20 South African cents, not even US cents, or British pence, and it is entirely waterproof. No water can get into it, and yet you can spend thousands of rands. Here's another lap wing, three in one. Thousands of rands on very expensive rain equipment, and, well, it almost universally fails to do its job. Then they try and sell you all sorts of uh, sprays that you should put on your clothes because the amount you've paid for them isn't enough. You must buy things to put on them. That is the Senegal lapwing, in my opinion, the best looking lapwing that we have over here. The Senegal lapwing. And it goes, I'm sorry, Louise. Louise says my rain poncho makes a lot of noise. I do apologize for that. See, it can hear me calling it. become irritating after a while, I suspect, so I'll stop. you probably also hear the howling of the wind. Yes, deja vu, thank you very much. I'm glad finally someone has acknowledged that you say I amaze you because I suffer so for your benefit. I am a trooper, a stoic trooper. Thank you. Yes, exactly. <laughs> On that note, there was a chap once who, <laughs> in all seriousness, I mean, there, there are a few things with egos larger than a new guide or ranger. You know, you give him a Land Rover, khaki uniform and a rifle and he thinks that, well, I mean, there are very few people who think they're more magnificent. Pilots think they're definitely more magnificent. Um, newly qualified doctors as well. But other than that, very few think they're more magnificent than a newly qualified guide. Firemen. Uh, f firemen, well, firemen are, you see, really. Yes. It's basically the uniform, eh? It's the uniform. Yeah, it's uni anyway, what this fellow did at a lodge was he was... <laughs> he, he, he was being given uphill by a camp manager because what happens in these lodges is that the guide thinks that he's the bee's knees and that everybody's there to see him and there for his benefit in general. And he got home late for breakfast one day, which was normally not a problem, as long as he told the camp manager that he was going to be late so that she could prepare the breakfast and it wasn't, you know, a sort of cold and congealed mass of uh, disgusting things. So she said to him, you know, please, what do you think you're doing? How, how dare you? She's almost certainly older than he was. And he looked her straight in the eye and in all seriousness said, I go out there every day to risk my life to pay your salary, and this is how you treat me. I think she just hit him. Well, she certainly would have been well within her rights to clock him one. Anyway, so I like to go into the final control before drive every so often and say, goodbye, everybody. I'm going out there to risk my life to pay your salaries. Naturally, I have to then run for the car, start it, and drive away very quickly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. There'll be a radio and an office chair following me out the door quite quickly. All righty, I'm going to try and get into a position to show you some antelope here. You're not going to see it through the this thing at the moment, so while I get into a position, head across to Sydney and see what he has.
I am now going back to the uh, uh, I'm going back to Vietalapen area to see what Tingana is doing as here around the tree house dam twins dam there is no sign of Hosanna so I'm going back to Tingana at the moment maybe you will find Tingana doing some activities that side When I heard that Tingana caught something, I thought Wasana will also go there because they, they always come together when there is a meal. When Hosanna takes something, Tingana goes there. Tingana takes something, Hosanna must also go there. Or maybe he's got his own meal at the moment somewhere. So the animals, such as the daycares, animals that uh, these uh, big cats are preying on the most, they are hiding today. And this weather is very much suitable. I thought we were going to see quite a lot of daycares, but daycares are hiding. A scholar who is five years old would like to know what Sydney will do if the leopard jumps into the car. Uh, scholar, these kind of cats, when seeing me on this vehicle as well as my camera operator, they see us as one object. They cannot distinguish between us and the vehicle. So they see us as one object. When the cats are coming very close to the vehicles, I just have to sit still and they will see they will go past. They, will, they won't do anything. So now, David is very much lucky with the elephants by the Masai Mara. Let's see how his elephants are doing this afternoon. Well, you better go back to Tingana, Sydney, and find out what you could be doing. And it has gotten a bit dark here if you look carefully on your screens there. And we're already on our infrared. And of course, one big advantage of infrared is not to interfere with the animal behavior. And what a scene we got there of three different species of animals all together. Wildebeest, zebras, Alice. And this tells you there's a lot of peace and harmony out in the game reserve. And basically lots of space for everybody and lots to eat. Elephants being both browsers and grazers, you can see they go picking some stuff, but you notice they are more on a fast move or motion. They are unlike the wildebeest and the zebras, which seem to be concentrated and not moving a lot, feeding. Elephants here don't have much of a choice, and what they're doing, they could just be passing through. But with the rains that have come now, you notice the small little plants that we just shoot and that's what elephants will pick up, not any grass here. But these two other species, the wildebeest and the zebras, they're enjoying the short, soft grass that have come as a result of the short rains. So just look carefully, the elephants move, pick and go, pick and go. Joy, very happy to know you are still watching and yes, that looks like a very nice, you know, uh, communal meeting because we are looking at four different species here. When I talk of four, I'm talking of the elephants and the wildebeest and the zebras. Not forgetting myself and Archie, Joy, what do you think? If we call ourselves Homo sapiens here, we got four species being together here and all of us in peace and harmony. Either they had a meeting on how they'll be managing their huge game reserve, which is massive. And maybe this could be marking the end of the get-together, Joy. And if that's the case, the elephants are maybe the first ones out. 
well, of the three species here, elephants eat, eat rather much more than the other two, so they need to move and get themselves to higher grounds or different food on their menu. The ground is a bit wet now because of the rains that we had earlier, and elephants have been known to suffer for food rot. Not what, what, I'm not sure what bird is on top of that tree there. Hink, I would say no. I would think the alleys in here in the Mara are much bigger than the ones in Juma. That's me, and I would want us to hear the same uh, comment or feeling from uh, James and Sydney. Uh, but the only thing I would say, the alleys here are much rounded. I would always say angle, they're much rounded than alleys in Juma. So they're slightly bit bigger, and the ones in Juma are slightly thinner. Not knowing a better way to explain that, but, uh, well, I'm not sure whether I could ask that same question to Archie, but maybe Jim, I mean, uh, James and Sydney can give me their feeling. But I would say, more James who have been here. Sydney has not been in Kenya before, but James has been here many times. I think the alleys here are much bigger and the ones in Juma are much smaller. I did not make head or tail of that uh, bird on top of that tree there, but I would think it's some kind of eagle. I would just guess it's kind of an eagle, definitely not a vulture. It's rather dark and it's quite a distance to get its outline very well with infrared. But it's kind of an... Oh, is it a vulture? Not very clear, but I would just guess it's an eagle. And I think it's time to look for birds in the darkness. Let's find out what bird James Henry got. It is a glossy starling of some sort, a great blue-eared one, or a cape glossy. I think it's a cape glossy. It's very difficult to tell in this light until they call. They're all doing their best to get away from the camera and become, or get behind the pole. Could be a mixed flock. So I'm just waiting to see if they'll call for us. Now, this sort of flocking behaviour is I've normally associated with winter, not with summer. So I'm not sure why they're flocking here unless there's another sort of insect emergence that's taking place. If you are a new viewer, uh, perhaps you haven't heard this before, but that of course is, we know that it is one of the two birds that I've given you. We can see it's a starling, that's obvious. It's got a yellow or orangish eye, which makes it one of two starling species. Now the greater blue eared should have blue ear coverts behind the eyes, but they're very difficult to see unless the light is really very very good. And these ones are stubbornly being completely silent. Hello Byron, I'm assuming you're not Byron Sarau, erstwhile resident of uh, southern Johannesburg and uh, well we could say so many things about Byron, I'm sure it's not you though. Um, you say, <laughs> You say, what rare birds do we get here? Well, it depends what you mean by rare. Do you mean rare for here or rare in general? I suppose rare or endangered would be all of the vultures. We discovered the other day that every single species of vulture we get here is now on the critically endangered list, so they're pretty rare. Something like a white-headed vulture, which has probably only been seen once or twice here, would be very rare. Uh, the saddle-billed storks are quite endangered. The... Um, What's the other one am I thinking of? Ground hornbills, they would be pretty rare. But you'll get some odd ones, Byron, that come through here during the summer. Um, you know, you'll have a sort of one sighting, they'll be here for a day and then they'll disappear. I'm thinking around this area, in fact, we had a broad-billed roller last year that hung around for a couple of weeks, so that was a really nice one. And we haven't seen him since at all. I'm to think of something other, something else similar. You might get something like a flock of lark-like buntings coming in for a little while and then disappearing. And think of other specials. Brent said he saw a, um, a Eurasian hobby here as a falcon. Tristan had a golden pipit last year, that's right. That was quite exciting. 
So it always pays to stop at the water holes and stop at anything that you can't see or that you don't quite recognize and then have a look at it. And the quarry busted is quite rare the other day. Corn crake was seen last year as well. Most of the rarities come with the rain. And if you have a really good rainy year, an unusually wet year, you'll normally pick up some nice specials. We're just trying to pick anything up at this stage. Not doing a very good job. Ah, Sydney is not far from here and he has returned, I think very wisely, to the old Duke. I am right back here where Tingana is. I can see Tingana is under a very nice umbrella. Moved back again to that little thick bush there. You can see there is he hiding. Same position as previous. So it means he's using this uh, little bush for cover and for the rain. He must have been eating a lot since this morning, as now for the whole two hours he's not showing any sign of eating. So it means he ate a lot since this morning. So these kind of cats can be able to eat up to uh, 30 to 40 kilograms. That is quite a lot of meat, as this meat don't easily get digested, so it must have to take time before the digestibility work on it. So the leopards in the wild, they can survive from 13 to 15 years, but in a captivity, it can be more than that. Because here in the wild, they experience quite a lot of ta challenges. There's a lot of fightings, and some of them, they easily get the tooth. When they start losing the tooth is when it's going to be very difficult for them to eat. And some experience problems when it comes to the territorial challenges. So in the captivities, these lepers, some of them, they are much safer. But in the wild, life is difficult. It's survival of the fittest. So you will see as time goes on, soon as uh, Hosanna starts to uh, demarcate the territory, there is going to be a problem between Hosanna and Tingan. And looking at how uh, Hosanna is growing, you can see that that cat is looking very much healthy and he's going to be one of those powerful cats. So you can see now that uh, Tingana is very much relaxed. Maybe uh, Osana has got an idea of inheriting the territory uh, when uh, Tingana is very, very old. That might also happen. But the problem is there's other males in the area as well who are on watch out. Males such as Ukumuri as well as, as Umfokazi. You know, the story between Tingana and uh, Umfokazi fascinated me a lot, whereby when Tingana got sick, Umfokazi came into the area. So you can see that these animals can be very, very much opportunistic and they're just waiting for something to happen in order to take over. Because when Tingana was sick, Umfokazi came back in order to take over. You can see that every day these animals, they are looking at each other, they are watching each other. So now let's go to James, who seems to be a successful birder this evening. He found another interesting bird. Well, interesting, yes, for so many reasons. This, of course, is Mrs. Wahlberg. She's looking a little bit disheveled, is our Mrs. Wahlberg. And for those of you who don't know, Mrs. Wahlberg arrived without Mr. Wahlberg this year back from her migration she arrived with a new bow and 
made me feel like she'd betrayed Mr. Wahlberg. He could easily have died, of course. She could have just moved on and upgraded to a younger model. Anyway, I haven't seen... In fact, I have seen him. I've just seen him. We couldn't actually provide you with a picture of him because of the rain roof, but he's not sitting far from here. I'm not sure that things are all as good as they might be in the Wahlberg household. They're often seen quite far from each other. Oh, no. Oh. Oh, this is interesting. While I was on leave, apparently two pale morph Wahlbergs and one dark morph were at the same nest where Mr. and Mrs. Wahlberg, who are both pale morph Wahlbergs, live. So maybe he's come back and he's here to assert himself and his rights. Come on, Mr. Wahlberg. That's very interesting indeed, actually. I wonder if maybe the dark morph isn't one of their offspring then. They didn't produce one last year, so he couldn't be from last year. But maybe he's from two years ago. That's not impossible. Oh, very interesting. The plot thickens in the soap opera of Mr. and Mrs. Wahlberg. Shame. She looks a bit wish, doesn't she? Often people say, and I often think it myself actually, how do animals cope in the rain? You know, they get wet, they don't find shelter. Of course, the only reason that they don't think that that's not normal is that they've never had shelter. And so they just cope with it. They just get cold for a while and suffer through it. She's got oil on her skin, of, or not on her skin, on her feathers, which will repel the water, of course. So she's got almost a natural rainproof jacket, unlike my unnatural, unrainproof jacket. And Tingana, for example, will lie under a bush or just eventually get wet and then shake himself out periodically and look miserable. There's nothing more miserable than a wet male lion. That's very funny. Yes, thank you, Louise. And Louise makes a good point. She says that technically my skin is water repellent and water, uh, waterproof. Well, she's absolutely right, of course. It's just it's cold, Louise, to get wet. Righty, let us move on from Mrs. Wahlberg. Ah, yes, yeah, sorry. Today is Tracking Tuesday, of course. Now, I'm supposed to bring my tracking book out with you, but uh, I, I don't actually have a tracking book, so I didn't bring it. But I'm going to show you the picture again, just in case you didn't see it. Uh, the answer, believe it or not, as most of you got correct... Uh, wait, I have to give you the wrong answers first. I uh, nearly got myself into trouble there. Wait one second, everybody. Here we go. Righty. We had some guesses. Uh, they were... The most popular guess was the correct guess, by the way, and I will show you the picture. Uh, that We had Hippo. Very, very, very small Hippo. Minuscule, in fact. Not a hippo. A pangolin? No, I'll explain what a pangolin one looks like as well. And a squirrel. Squirrel also I can explain. All right, so it was in fact a scrub hare. There is the picture. Now, that's not going to mean a great deal to you. You really need to quite get quite close up to it and have a, a decent look. There we are. But basically what it is, is four stamps totally indistinct can you see that they look completely indistinct and that's because of course there's a lot of fur on the foot of a scrub hair and so it doesn't actually leave any toe marks it just leaves these sort of indistinct stamps that look like miniature if you like really miniature elephant tracks for example without the toes in them i can see why the per one person thought it might have been a hippo if the entire thing was the hippo and it wasn't four individual feet but it is in fact a scrub hair now if you were looking at a squirrel what you would see is you would definitely see in this kind of 
of substrate, which is sand, you would see the impressions of their little claws, and they run in such a way that it's very easy to see that they're squirrels. Their front feet are close together, their back feet further apart, and they run, they're bound, basically. So back feet and then front feet, back feet and then front feet, and you can see them moving like that with the back feet further apart than the front feet. You can very easily tell. A pangolin track is also fairly indistinct. Uh, it's sort of much smaller back feet than front feet, quite long claws on the front foot, but also you'd see the tail dragging along the ground with the pangolin quite often. Okay, so there it is, tracking Tuesday as well, and all of you who got it right, and for the person who said it was a hippopotamus, I do sympathize, I see now why you said that, but perhaps a bit more studying before next time. Good. Right, it now looks like Tingana is going to get up, so I'm going to drive around a bit and we will see you hopefully with something exciting soon. I can see now that Tingana has just decided to move from the thick bush bushes to the open space, so I'm just driving around so that we can have a better sighting. Oh, here is he. He's just lying down here. So he's just lying down here, facing the other side. So you can see that uh, these cats, their bellies are very much full. Look at that. Ah, uh, he ate a lot already. Maybe he's gonna carry on feeding tonight. He doesn't want to feed here while we're here at the moment. So it's going to take him a couple of days before hunting again. But if another cat such as Wasana takes something, he's still gonna go there and eat. So Tingana never gets full, always eating. <laughs> That's a very lovely uh, a comment. Yeah, this cat, it likes to eat too much. I have seen that. So look at those paws there. You can see that the belly is there. There's a very big hump at the moment. So that is too much food in the stomach. So he's just now trying to have the space open so that he can load more. I think too much food in the stomach makes him tired. You can see that he's looking very much tired. A blue, that is true. The stomach looks the biggest portion uh, of his body. You can see that. So you can see the stomach looks big like this, but this animal can still go and drink quite a lot of water. So it's quite a very big stomach. So the territories of this kind of predators, such as leopards, is not determined by the available females. It is determined by the population of the prey. When the prey animals are densely populated is when you will see this kind of case the most. So they've got to make sure that there is quite a lot of water and food available. As if there is no such, they are going to have a problem because for them to challenge each other with regards to the females and mating, they must have to be very strong, healthy, and they must be feeding on very good food. So they consider the available food in the area before the females. So now let's go back to James and see how James is doing at the moment.
I'm doing fine. I'm sitting with a troop of baboons, and interestingly, this female baboon is walking very close to us. It's very unusual. Are you blind or just brave? Well, it is a female nurse. You know what it is. It's a young male. Right, and then we've gone back up into the tree where they're roosting. They're roosting in little couples, it looks like. They're in the jackalberry tree at the junction of Central Road and Gurry Cutline. And they seem to be roosting in couples, which is quite interesting. I'm not sure that I've seen that before. It's rather fetching. It's quite sweet. They're all having little last conversations of the day, whispering sweet nothings into each other's ears, having the old mutual grooming session. A little bit of pillow talk, as Louise says. Yes, absolutely. No doubt there'll be some mating too, and these baboons don't let an opportunity to mate go by. But this is not... Them. I'm saying they're couples. They're not necessarily couples. There could easily be, you know, male, young male and older male, or young female and older female, or just two females and males the same age, except they do look to be different sizes, all of the individuals in these little couples. In a baboon troop, of course, there's a hierarchy amongst the males and, to a certain extent, amongst the females much less rigidly enforced than it is amongst the males. But, interestingly, some males will form a bond with the females, even though that bond can look almost like friendship, where there is no mating activity that takes place. They just forage together, they might roost together like this, but there's no mating that takes place. Which I, is very interesting and it's very difficult for biologists to understand because it doesn't seem to make a great deal of sense. And often that will be the case if the male is low ranking. And some females will tolerate that and they will enjoy and encourage the presence of this male around them. They'll interact and groom with him. And others will just be mean and nasty to him, often the more dominant ones. So this kind of situation where it looks like there are a whole lot of romancing couples up in the top of that tree is not a kind of normal one necessarily. You wouldn't expect that to be the case. Those two are just chewing the fat. Wondering when it's going to warm up. Well, deja vu, you said it, you say springtime, love is in the air. Well, it certainly seems to be in that tree. That is the love tree. We could make a baboon soap opera called The Love Tree. Do you think you'd watch that, Sebastian? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I think I would. It would depend on who was narrating it, of course. And who are the actors? Yes. Louise, we're not talking about that anymore. Louise just mentioned something that I don't want to mention. I spoke about it the other day, and I was embarrassed yet again. Right, I'm going to sit with these baboons a bit longer. Let's go back to their mortal enemy. So you can see that now here I am still having Tingana lying down trying to digest some impala in the stomach at the moment. And then the visitors are starting to come back. I saw that the hyenas, they are now coming back. You can hear quite a lot of birds are also making a lot of calls. So the birds are going to sleep now, those who are active during the day, and give a chance to those other birds who are much more active at night. So I was saying the hyenas are again starting to come back. I can see two that I saw earlier are slowly approaching the area where Tingana is lying at the moment. So these hyenas, they are getting some of the meat from the ground and hyenas their aggression is also motivated by what is in their stomach and that is what makes them go and chase these big cats when they're too hungry so you can see that uh, his head was up he's looking at them they're just on the other side of the uh, dry riverbed
it has been quite a, a lovely sighting having him here lying down not feeding was also an ornament as it's one of those animals i haven't seen for quite a long time it has been a very fantastic afternoon with quite a lot of lion sighting in the mara and some elephants and buffaloes and also a lot of interesting birds here by the juma game reserve together with tingana and thank you very very much for all your questions and comments let's meet again tomorrow morning